This is the Sideline Slice, presented by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers. Here's your host, Jessica Cooty, and Husker Radio Network analyst, Jeremiah Searles. We're back with another episode of the Sideline Slice with Jeremiah Searles. I'm Jessica Cootie, but I guess for this episode, we could call it the Booth Slice, too. Mm. Searles going to be on the call with us in the booth with Greg Sharp on the analyst call. How excited are you? We're so excited I, that you're going to be on the call this week. I can't wait. And it's just icing on the cake that I get to go to Folsom to have my first radio call because I, like I said last week, I still have a disdain for CU. And now <laughs> all the CU bandwagoners that are jumping all aboard that train, they just fuel my hate fire. I can't wait to be in the booth in Folsom. I think this is going to be an electric atmosphere. It's going to be so much fun. These are the games that, as a player, you can just get so geared up for. I'm going to have to curb myself down so I don't freak out too much in the booth. But that'll, that'll be a learning progress. Greg will have to throw me, throw me a bone every now and then when I start freaking out. Do you, where does Colorado rank on your hate list? Mm, probably second behind Wisconsin. Okay. Yeah, Wisconsin's still first just because of the embarrassment they handed me in the Big Ten Championship game. But CU is, CU, CU's a long-standing hate. CU's like 16-year-old Jeremiah hate type that's just building and festering for half my life. So th for those that are unaware, you're from Colorado, right? You got a lot of family members that wanted you to be a buff. Right? My, my entire family went to see you. I mean, like all of them, cousins, aunts, uncles, all of them are buff Boulder grads. Like when I, when I picked Nebraska, there was a riff in the family, <laughs> right? They're like, they were all, they better be dead than red and all of that, right? So there, there is some family ties there. You know, I get a chance, some of them still live in Boulder, so I'm gonna get a chance to go see them when we get there and I like, go out with them. But yeah, I mean, I'm wearing my, my Buffs Down shirt from old Triple B printing here because it's just, it's Buffalo Hate Week, right? There's Iowa Hate Week, there's Buffalo Hate Week, and I, I'm all aboard for all of them. You also like to eat Buffalo, I right? I love to eat. I love to eat. <laughs> I love to eat Buffalo. Hey, so I've never been there. How's the stadium, the atmosphere, all of that? Well, I mean, the atmosphere when I played there was trash because they weren't any good. Um, you know, but after what they did last week to TCU, the Dion effect, I anticipate this being one of the more hostile environments that Nebraska will play in this year. You know, you talk about a home opener for a sellout crowd that – couldn't be more excited with their national champion team after week one, right? Everyone's <laughs> crowning them kings, right? Like, it's going to be super electric. Now, the stadium itself is okay, but the atmosphere, like, the surrounding, like, right at the base of the flat irons, like, the view of the stadium is top-notch, right? It's very cool atmosphere to be around, very cool area, but the stadium itself needs a few, few renovation works, that's for sure. I've been told not to wear red. Oh, uh, I mean... Yeah, probably smart. You better believe I'm gonna be as red as can be. Um, I'm gonna, I might wear a red hat, red glasses, red shoes. It doesn't matter. I'm, I'm sporting loud and proud the red and been bolder this weekend. I said I'm. Just, I did. I'm I did tell my parents not it. to. What? I did tell my parents not to. I told my parents maybe wear like a gray or something. Maybe not a bright red shirt, but knowing my dad, he'll, he'll, re he'll wear red. So I had a red polo packed to wear, but I, I'm like, I could wear the white with the N, red in, but I'm kind of ready to just roll with it, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm ready should. to embrace whatever hate I got. I think there's going to be a lot more red there than people think, too. You I know, think last so, too. Time, last time CU, we played CU, the stadium was very, very red, even though they did the best they could. You know, I think they're going to do a little bit better this year just because of where their program's at. But I do think, I mean, there was a plenty of red in Minnesota, too. You know, Husker fans travel with the best of them. So I anticipate there being a lot of red in that stadium as well. What kind of prep are you doing for the booth? You know, I've been tearing through the tape. You know me, I'm a tape junkie. So, you know, I've ripped through the Nebraska game about three times. I'm on my second time through the CU game already. I'm just kind of looking for schemes that they run, what they're going to do to us, how we can defend them. You know, I'm putting my coach hat on trying to think of what I would do, and it's going to make myself easier for the call as things are happening in front. Um, tell you this, a lot easier to memorize a two deep instead of trying to call a spring game where there's 150 names that you have to memorize. So that's a lot easier. You know, I've just been pouring through the depth charts, making sure I get some pronunciations right. I don't need to be calling people the wrong name. And uh, just going to try and make you guys proud. You know, I just want to make you and Greg, and I just want to make you guys proud of me. You guys are like proud dads. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, okay, let's dive into uh, the Minnesota game first, and then we'll talk Colorado and what we've seen out of them and the matchup there. 
Man, just another heartbreaker. But I did feel this, and, and you might feel a different way, but I told Greg this. It didn't, you know, I know it was another close loss, but this loss felt different because it felt like Nebraska was really in control of this one up until the last three minutes, whereas in the past, some of these close losses, you're like, oh, no, here we go. You, you lost the momentum at some point, but it didn't seem like that was ever the case. It really felt like Nebraska had a hold of this thing up until the last two and a half minutes. Yeah, you know, I was really impressed with our defense. I'm going to start there. You know, I think everyone had a lot of question marks, including myself, about what is this 3-3-5 defense going to look like? Can they hold up against a team like Minnesota that's just going to line up and run the football? And that is the best defensive performance I've seen a, a Husker team have in probably the last five years. You know, the way that they ran to the football, the way that they all rallied and tackled, and there wasn't a ton of missed tackles. There were still a few, but, you know, I thought that for the most part, a lot of good wrapping up. A lot of good going after it, you know, and I just love the way that they played with their hair on fire, right? All 11 guys were running, and, and it was chaos, right? Looking at the tape, sometimes I can't even tell what's going on. You got guys looping this way and running that way and coming off the ball, you know, but to have the five DBs on the field and to have those five guys play really high-level football was really big for us. You know, I'm going to single out guys like Singleton. I thought Hartsog. I thought those dudes played incredibly well. You know, and then you talk about Luke Reimer and Bullock in there, both pressuring the quarterback and in coverage. I thought they did a really nice job, too. You know, so I was really pleased with the way that our defense really came to play and stepped up to bat. I mean, you hold that team to three and a half quarters of seven points or whatever it was, three points maybe. You know, that's just a great, great thing for our defense to do, something they're really going to be able to build off momentum-wise. And I'm starting to see the, the vision of Tony White's defense. I'm starting to see the vision of what he wants us to be. And the more speed we're going to be able to get on the edges, the more physicality out of the guys up front, the vision is just going to continue to get better and better and better. And so I'm super excited for what this defense is going to look like under Tony White. You said it was chaos, but, you know, I, I've said this too, that it, it, I was, you know, standing there on the sideline and seeing the communication and the cohesiveness between the defensive staff and they are running a lot of people in and out right there are a lot of different players that that saw playing time and and how they were staying kind of it was orchestrated chaos i guess organized it, it, yeah organized, organized chaos, chaos. And, and and it might look like chaos to us but they knew exactly what they were doing i was really impressed with the cohesiveness of the defensive unit and and the defensive staff yeah, you know, I didn't really, again, it's hard for me to, without knowing the scheme perfectly, because I'm still learning the 3 through 5 myself, I didn't see a ton of mental errors, right? You didn't see a lot of free runners in coverage. You didn't see a lot of guys getting out of their gap and having a big explosive run for 30 or 40 yards because a guy got missed in a gap or those type of things. And that's when I say organized chaos is that's what the offense is supposed to see is chaos. They're not supposed to understand what's happening. They're not supposed to understand who's going where. But if the defense can understand the scheme and understand where everything fits, then they're at the advantage. And for 95% of that game, I felt like Nebraska had the advantage on Minnesota. That all being said, they have put themselves on tape now. And good offensive coordinators and good teams throughout, especially in the Big Ten, are going to start to scheme what that looks like, how that looks like. But trying to figure out a week-in and week-out basis of how to scout this team, meaning if you're CU for this week example, you're trying to teach your defense to show a scout look of what Nebraska's defense is going to be, that's really hard to do because when you can't even draw it up on the card because you're not entirely sure, it's hard to give a good look. Right, so I think that I mean we'll talk about that in the spring. Of we want to make it really hard on teams to prep during the week, and I think with this defense, it's really hard to try because again, so many personnel groups, so many different guys in and out. It's going to be hard to give a look during the week. So I still think we have the advantage going into this game of see you're going to have to try to figure out what we're doing, and I think it does give us advantage to get after this team a little bit. How much do you think? I mean, you you said going into Minnesota, you thought Tony White would throw everything in the kitchen sink at Minnesota. Do you think he held anything back, or do you think it's all out there? You know, I think I think it's all out there, but I also think Tony White's a good enough coordinator to know that you're going to have flavor of the weeks, right? You're going to have a you're going to have a new blitz for third down every single week that you're going to install every single week, right? Whether it's the same blitz out of a different front or the same blitz out of a different personnel group, right? It's just going to be different to that offense, right? So I think we'll see some new wrinkles. I think we'll see some new things, especially when you're talking about polar opposite offenses that we're going against from week one to week two, right? Week one, you're going against a Minnesota offense that wants to grind the clock, run the football between the tackles, 
have long drives versus a CU offense that's going to be hurry up, quick passes, get the ball out of his hand, and try and go rack up as many plays as possible. So the scheme itself is going to change a little bit, but I do think Tony Weiss got some good things in his pocket. Ty Robinson, how dominant was he before oh. he made his exit? Ty, no, you can't headbutt the guys, dude. Oh, just bench press them into the ground, right? But, you know, he had a fantastic game. You know, I thought that he was a wrecking ball in there. Nash was another guy that I thought really showed up well to play. But, you know, with the exit of Ty Robinson, we saw it late in the fourth quarter. Our depth was tested. But our depth was tested, and we had young guys in there. I mean, we had Judy in there. We had Roquel Williams in there. Like, we had all those guys in there in meaningful, critical situations, and it didn't work out well for us this time. But that's just going to lead for them to continue to grow, lead for them to continue to get better, right? And we are going to miss Ty Robinson. Right, there's no way you can't replace a guy that's played that much football, has been that productive, has been so instrumental in what this defense has been in the last four years. He's going to be missed in the first half, but the good news is it's only the first half, right? So let's make sure that we can go out there, have the young guys play well, and then have a fresh, ready to go, hair on fire, no hair, whatever it is, <laughs> ready to go in the second half there, and have him come out and be a game changer for us in quarters three and four. Yeah, it's going to be tough to overcome without him in that, that first half. But uh, mm -hmm. Coach Rule did say that, hey, you better expect to play every single snap of the second half. And um, I think he will. What about – Roquan uh, Buckley, by the way. i got to apologize. I'm still learning names. I'm still trying to get better. <laughs> Roquan Buckley is the guy that I think we're going to see a lot more. Not Williams. Gosh dang it. All right, let's flip to the other side of the ball. I mean, you, you just can't say it any other way. You can't turn the ball over four times, bottom no. line. Yeah, I don't care if you're playing the sisterhood of the blind, deaf, and dumb. You turn the ball over four times, you're not going to win many football games. It's just not the way it works, right? And especially you talk about critical turnovers and in critical situations. You're, you're going to hear me use this word a lot this year, the critical situations, because I went back and looked at all the Nebraska losses over the last year when I was getting ready for the season. And so many of those losses were during what I would refer to as critical situations, which are short yardage, red zone, end of game, right? And so when you talk about having... You talk about having a turnover in the red zone early in the game, which takes points off the board. And then you talk about having a fumble, another fumble at a critical situation where you're trying to put the game away. And then you have the interception in a two-minute drill, which is another critical situation, right? So you talk about three of the four turnovers being in those critical situations. That's really going to hurt you, right? You can overcome a, an interception in the middle of the first or in the early part of the second or, or, or late, early in the third. But when you start getting where that clock's against you or when you have points on the board and you get those points taken away, those really come back to bite you at the end of the game. And those are learning experiences. Those are learning growth. You know, it's a guy from Jeff Sims who, yes, he's played a lot of football, but not for under the big red, right? And a guy like Anthony Grant, you have to know that when you're running through contact like that and you break through the first line of scrimmage, you have to think about the guy coming from behind you. Now, was it a great play by that corner to just come off, get off the block of Ethan Piper and punch that ball out behind him? Yes, that was a great play by a defensive player. But you have to understand where are we at in the game? What's the biggest thing? Is fighting for that extra yard and a half here the most important thing? Or is two hands on the football and living to fight another down and take another 40 seconds off the clock the most important thing? Right? And so those are all things that Rule and Satterfield are going to coach through this week. But, you know, I was really pleased with the way that Jeff Sims ran the football, the way Gabe Irvin ran the football. And those are some really good things that we need to see because if we want to be a run first offense, you got to start with your play playmakers being able to get through the line of scrimmage, which I did see from those guys. But if we can clean up some of those unforced errors, forced errors, however you want to say it, we'll give ourselves a better chance to win at the end of the game. Coach Rule said that Jeff Sims really dove into the film and was up here late watching film. What, what are the things that, that Jeff can go back and watch and, and learn from when he's diving into that film to improve you know, on that decision making? Yeah, you know, I, watching all of his interceptions, he got locked in on those receivers. Right, especially the last one in two minute, right? They're in a single high format. I watched the free safety walk down over the tight end. So right, pre snap read is this is man coverage with his cover one up high. Right. They're gonna play press man with the for the free safety being the rover. And he immediately locked on to I, I believe it was Marcus Washington who was running that deep slant or that deep post and you know, he never looked off the safety. He was over, and he looked over to his right side the whole time. And instead of looking off the safety to give himself that window to throw, he locked in on him, which allowed the safety to read his eyes and undercut the route. You know, same thing with the turnover right before half. 
you know, he has a chance there to have his tight end who's running a hook curl standing at the goal line, but he got locked on that corner route and didn't allow the route to develop well enough for him to really see it and plug it in there. You know, so I'm sure he's looking at the tape and he's going, okay, let's make sure I get through my reads. How can I look off safeties? How can I understand my coverage before pre-snap? Just getting a better feel for that in this offense and what it looks like. And I do expect him to take a big jump from week one to week two. Right? I think a lot of players... Every team takes their biggest jump of the year from week one to week two, and that's because a lot of individuals take big jumps. So I do anticipate a guy that's played a lot of football before to have that big jump from week one to week two. And let's be honest, this offense is going to go as number seven goes, right? I think it was very apparent last week how he runs the football, how he throws the football, like he is the key that's going to make this offense go. And so we need him to step up. We need him to have a better week this week. And I think if that gives us the chance to win football games when he takes care of the ball and he makes plays with his legs. All right, O-line, how would you grade those guys? That's what everyone wants to know, your, your take on that. You know, I thought Ben Scott actually played a very good game for his first game at center for us. Bryce Benhart also played a very good game. You know, I think he's taken big strides from last year to this year. That was very apparent. Um, you know, the left side of our line struggled at times. You know, I think Turner and um, Piper, or Turner and Nuri, or, you know, they rotated some guys in there. You know, there's a couple times where you got two guys on one and they're splitting them. Right, or there's a, a run through through the A-gap and they miss it. Right, Those are just unacceptable errors as an offensive lineman, especially for some guys that have played some, some big-time football for us. You know, Those are some things that are not a physical beat but a mental error, and you can't have mental errors as an offensive lineman because the play is dead. Right, like If you get beat physically but you get on a guy and it's the right guy, like you can make something happen. But if you have a mental error and there's an unblocked guy in the hole or you get split because you both are going to the wrong linebacker or whatever, that's when bad things happen. And that happened a little too much for my liking from the offensive line point. What I did love is the physicality that they did play with. I thought that they played very physical. I thought they were running off the ball really well. I thought they got up on the second level well. We just need to clean up some of the point of attack stuff from a mental side of it to give ourselves a chance. Too many times in the run game, we just never had a chance because it was a mental error, right? So we got to clean up some of those mental errors. And I know for a fact, Rayola is not putting up with that. He is on them about that. And again, big jump from week one to week two. And watching this CU defense, the most vulnerable place for them is between the tackles. They have skill positions. They have speed on the edges. If we can take advantage of their lack of size in the middle, we have a chance. We have a chance to run it right in the A gap and the B gap of these guys and physically take it to them because they don't have a lot of depth at defensive line. We need to wear them out up front. Valentino's, a slice of home you just can't get anywhere else. What started with a treasured family recipe in Lincoln, Nebraska has become a classic Italian tradition for 65 years. All right, let's move to Colorado and talk about the Buffs. What, I guess, impressed you the most in watching their game against TCU? Travis Hunter. Mm -hmm. That dude is a special type of talent. You know, when you talk about a guy playing both ways, and not just playing, but making game-changing plays on both sides of the football, you got to know where 12 is at all times. Right, that was super impressive. The other thing that I thought was really impressive by them was their ability to get the ball out of the quarterback's hand quickly. Right, think back to Purdue with Aiden O'Connell. Right, how he's ball in hand, ball gone, ball in hand, ball gone. The quick passing game for CU is very, very good. They were in a great rhythm against TCU. When I watch that, and I think, okay, how do you combat that? Our corners got to put their big boy pants on this week. They got to get up in these receivers' faces and really challenge them at the line of scrimmage, right? You can't allow just five-yard dink and dunks all the way down the field because those five-yard dink and dunks with the skill positions that CU have and the speed that CU has on the outside, the yards after catch are going to be huge, right? If a five-yard slant turns into a 20-yard real quick if that quarterback hits him in stride. I thought Sanders was really accurate with his ball placement. But what CU didn't do, and I don't think they do, right, is run the football. Right, And so that's why I'm saying corners get up there and press those dudes so that our defense can really press this line of scrimmage and make them run the football. Make them have to get in and try and control clock. If you make them go three and outs really quick because they're getting thrown incompletes, getting the ball back to our offense is great. Also, we got to tackle. TCU might be the worst tackling football team in the country right now. I don't know, LSU and Clemson were also pretty terrible this weekend. But, you know, I thought for week one we were great at tackling on defense we got to carry that in because these dudes with the ball in their hand are really special. we got to gang tackle and wrap all these dudes up. 
Yeah, I, I think that was, you, you have this kind of notion about TCU and that it's a defensive team, but Gary Patterson is no longer there, and he was the guy that was known as the defensive mind. So I just did not think that looked like a typical TCU defense. I mean, Colorado was able to do pretty much anything except for, they didn't run it well. Like you said, 55 rushing yards only. Uh, 1.6 yards per rush, but they threw it for 510 yards. So <laughs> you think that our defensive backs are going to be up for the challenge of those guys on the outside for Colorado? We have to be, right? They're going to want to come out and sling it all over the yard, right? That's what their game plan is. That's what they want to be. We need to find a way to get them to try and run the football more because the game, the quick passing game isn't working. You know, I do think what something that I did see that Minnesota did late in the game was we are an aggressive defense. They hit us with a couple screen passes at the end of the game, which hurt us. And I do think CU has a good screen game. We saw it a couple times against TCU. I think they're going to try and early on try and hit us with a few screen passes so that it'll slow down our aggressiveness, right? And that's okay. I don't want it to slow down our aggressive. We just have to be really good at tackling in, in space, right? They're going to get a few on us. This offense is too good to think we're just going to shut them down completely. But I do think if they hit a few screens on us early, I don't want us to panic and just understand, hey, that just comes with the nature of being an aggressive defense. Sometimes they get you. you know. But as long as we can tackle and not let that screen game get too out of hand, I'm all right with it because I do love the aggressive nature of the way that Tony White wants to get after the quarterback. A lot of people made uh, – I've seen a lot of people talk about how, oh, TCU is a 3-3-5, Nebraska is a 3-3-5. But these are really different 3-3-5 defenses, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, our 3-3-5 is built much more physically than TCU's. Right, TCU is, in my opinion, they play in the Big 12, right? They're used to getting the ball thrown at them all the time, right? We're, we're a team that's going to be physical up front. And I don't think TCU had any world beaters up front either. And, yeah, we're young. We got some guys. But I think our linebackers are much more aggressive and much better in pass rushing than TCU's were, right? So our ability to get the, our linebackers on the running backs of CU's and have them win their one-on-one -on -one matchups, I think that's a little bit better for us. Also, I think we're a little bit more blitz-heavy off of one game that I watched of Nebraska versus uh, Minnesota and TCU versus CU. I think, I think that Nebraska is a bit more aggressive with their blitz packages than TCU was. TCA, TCU is able to run for 262 yards. You mm -hmm. alluded to this. How much do you think uh, Nebraska will be able to have some success running the football against the Colorado front? We have to. It has to be where we win this game. We have to win it on the line of scrimmage. You know, I talked about it. CU's got athletes. They got a lot of athletes. What they don't have is size. And if there's one thing Nebraska has right now, it's big, strong, physical guys up front, right? So Ben Scott, Piper, Nuri, Be Bryce Benhart, Fedoni, Borkacher, those dudes really need to say, like, we will carry us through this game, right? Let's get us into third and manageables, right? Let's win on first and second down with the run game. Let's put us in third and threes, third and twos, right? Because those are the way that we can make sure to, to limit their ability to use their athleticism on the edge. And TCU showed it. They have a weak underbelly. They really do. And we have to take advantage of that. We have to control the clock because the best way to slow down a high-tempo, high-power, fast-flying offense, keep them on the sideline. Right? Take a page out of Minnesota's book. Let them only have one offensive possession in the first half. You can't score 50-some-odd points if you don't have a bunch of possessions. Right. Right. And the way you do that is by controlling the clock with the run game. Right. Gabe Irving showed some great flashes. Great, great flashes. I thought that he ran the ball hard. He ran really well. Same with Grant and Ramir Johnson. We have three really talented running backs. Let's take full advantage of those guys, and let's give all those guys a chance to go out there and run all over the place. I was going to ask you that. That was my next question is how much is it going to be the who gets to play their tempo is going to dictate how this game goes because Colorado wants to play fast and score fast and Nebraska is going to want to play slower. I mean, how much is that going to maybe be a big factor in, in how this game goes is which team gets to play their style? For sure. The last thing we want to do is get in a shootout with CU, right? We don't want to get into a TCU, CU type of game. That's not what we're built for. Right? We're not built for the – let's just throw it all over the yard and do that. Like we're very much built to run the football, control the tempo of the game, make them play our tempo, right? Because nothing is more frustrating for an opposing team. And I've been on the other side of this when we used to be a tempo football team. When we go out there and we go three and out, and then the other team gets it and they drive for six, seven minutes, get a field goal, get a touchdown, and then we go right back out there and use tempo again and take – 50 seconds off the clock and either get another three and out or one first down, right? That is super frustrating to an opposing defense 
that's what we need to do to see you. We need to find a way to have long drives, take the crowd out of it, right? When you have seven, eight, ten play drives, it takes the crowd out of it. They can't get up and loud. And then when that offense goes out there, if we can find a way to shut them down and make them get off the field quickly, that's how we control and we dictate the tempo. If we start trying to get out there and they score seven, we score seven, like I think that's a, a, a game that we lose because that's not what we're built for and that's what they're built for. So, so much of the chess match of Matt Rule and Deion Sanders are going to be how can we get to our tempo and play our style of football instead of having to try and match the other team's tempo. Where's the biggest matchup you're going to be paying the closest attention to? I mean, it's going to be, I think the biggest matchup is going to be Quentin Newsom and Malcolm Hartsog on Travis Hunter, right? How do we limit his ability to impact this football game? And you saw it last week. If he can get the ball in his hands, it's a great thing. So let's stay pressed on him. Let's beat him up physically at the line of scrimmage. You know, if he gets a chance to try and run a screen or something, have a D lineman coming back, taking a big hit on that guy, you know, he weighed, I think, 120 snaps last week, which is incredible for anyone, you know, so... I don't know him. I'm sure he's a great athlete, but that's not a sustainable thing, right? The more plays you take, the more susceptible you're going to be to injuries because the body just breaks down. Granted, yes, it's early in the season, but the more body blows we can get on him and take shots on him of legal shots, hard hits, the better. You know, So that's going to be a big matchup that I'm watching. And then the other matchup is really, I think I said already, Coach Rule and Coach Sanders. I think that that's going to be one of the biggest matchups of how who can outcoach the other one here, right? you got to find ways to put your guys in the best positions possible, and I think that's going to be really apparent early in the game by based off how those two guys coach against each other. By the way, Colorado had four receivers with over 100 yards receiving yeah. against TCU. They threw it all over the yard. Was, yeah. If you're a defensive guy, you hated that football game. <laughs> So it's going to be, I mean, it's not just a matchup with one guy. It's really the matchup of the secondary against Colorado's wide receivers, right? Yeah, I mean, that, that's the matchup. That's the matchup. Can we limit their ability to quick pass us to death? And then we can't get lulled to sleep. You know, I think a couple times TCU was trying to get up there and press and press. Like, man, this quick passing game is killing us, killing us. And then they took a couple deep shots over the top. I mean, Travis Hunter dropped a, a touchdown, a lot of shots to the corners, right? They're going to take their shots. So we got to make sure that we're staying pressed, staying tight. But those safeties have to stay disciplined that nothing can get behind them. You kind of already alluded to this. We'll see if it's the same, but your, your players to watch offense, defense. Yeah, I mean, offense is going to be Jeff Sims. We got, we got to see. I think I said it last week, too, but it's like I said, he, he is the key to what this offense is, and we will go as he goes, right? So I want to see the jump that he takes from week one to week two. It needs to be a big jump. On defense, you know, I think the biggest player that I'm looking for is I'm going to see how Singleton plays because we're really going to need him to have a big game. I thought he did a great job in run support last week. He came up. He was making hits in the line of scrimmage in the backfield. Really good tackling. We're going to need him to show up in the pass game this week. He plays that rover, that middle area. Him and Gifford, right, those two guys kind of play that middle area of the field. They're going to have to be our erasers. If something goes wrong and there's a one-on-one -on -one tackle, they're going to have to make those tackles. Or if they need to vice Travis Hunter and go double-team him, make sure they get over there and don't get caught with their eyes in the backfield, right? They have to be very assignment sound. So Gifford and Singleton are my two guys to watch on defense and obviously Jeff Sims on offense. All right, three biggest keys for Nebraska to leave Boulder with the W. Number one, win the turnover battle. We cannot turn the football over, right? You talk about an offense that can score quickly. Don't give them a chance to have a short field. Don't give them a, a extra possessions, right? So, and also take the ball away, right? Take the ball away. Find a way to get him to throw a pick, sack, fumble, rip it out of their hands. Like, we need to win the turnover margin. We can't, if we get out of Boulder with a, a plus turnover margin, we're going to win that game. I think the second key on offense, control the clock run the football, have over 250 yards rushing in this game would be massive. A couple uh, over 100 yard rusher, maybe Sims breaks one, right? I think that's going to be really important. And then on special teams, flip the field, flip the field, punters, kickers, kickoffs, you know, those things, la make them go the distance. Don't give them a chance on a short field, right? Don't give them to go 40 or 50, make them go 80 and earn it all the way down the field. Were you a prime fan growing up? No. no. I've nope. never been. He's a DB. You think I was a prime fan? I'm not a DB fan. I don't like. Oh, no, I know. I know better than that. You don't like. De you know better. Defensive backs or wide receivers. You know better. <laughs> it's gonna be fun though. His uh, oh, home debut and the the bandwagon that is running out of room for those Colorado people jumping on it. I'm I'm excited about this atmosphere. I've heard so much about it and coming from the Big 12 and Colorado is in the Big 12, but I've never been. So I I'm. Really looking forward to experiencing this atmosphere, even if people yell at me for wearing red. I'm fine with it. 
I have one more key. Okay. I, I have one more key, and that's going to be weather the initial storm of emotion because it's going to be a very high emotional start to this game, right? You talk about all the other factors outside the white lines, the prime effect, first home game, coming off beating the 17th team in the country. It's going to be loud. It's going to be crazy. Keeping our composure early in this game and not allowing us to let our emotions run amok as a player, as a coaching staff, is going to be really important because whenever you're on the road in a hostile environment, the game can get away from you because you start trying to match the emotion of the stadium instead of just controlling what you can control, right? So we really, as an offense specifically, have to be dialed into our snap counts, have to be dialed into our assignments, have to be dialed into our substitutions, right? We can't afford to burn a timeout early because we have the wrong personnel on the field. All that stuff's going to play a factor because of how emotionally charged that place is going to be. Weather the initial storm, settle into the game, and then get going. Don't allow your emotions to run out of control. Let that be the color analyst job this week. The emotions <laughs> running out of yeah. control, right? I'll have plenty of emotions up. I'm going to need like a shock collar that Greg can buzz me every now and then when I start running off the rails. <laughs> oh, it should be fun. Looking forward to it. And you're actually going to also be on the segment this week for picks. You're, you're back in the game mm -hmm. for picks this, this year, and you just... Text them in last week, but you're going to actually be on I'll be the segment. Here. I'll be here for the picks this week. Purdue let me down. I gave I gave the <laughs> Boilermakers a chance. Can't can't do that again. And then again, LSU let me down too. So LSU let everybody down. LSU let everyone down. LSU and Clemson, good job. Slow clap for LSU and Clemson. Good job, everybody. All right. Well, we'll look forward to seeing you on Friday and then in the booth on Saturday. Let's do this. Absolutely. Can't wait. Go Big Red. All right. For Jeremiah Searles, I'm Jessica Cootie. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Sideline Slice presented by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers.